This hearing will come to order. I wish you a good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing on basic energy research in the DOE Office of Science. There's been a lot of attention in recent years on developing a new clean energy technologies, but not enough on strengthening the foundations that will make these future technologies possible. That's what the Basic Energy Sciences Program uh, in the Office of Science is all about. This program covers a wide range of fundamental research that supports our efforts to achieve major advancements in energy technologies. Basic research in materials, science, physics, and chemistry will enable us to make cheaper, more efficient solar cells, long-lasting batteries for plug-in hybrid vehicles, and high-temperature semiconductors that would dramatically reduce energy losses on the electric grid. And these are just a few examples. This afternoon, we'll also hear about the important role played by major research facilities built and managed by the BES program. These facilities are real jewels of our national research infrastructure. They're utilized by over 9,000 people each year, including professors and students from universities across the country, as well as researchers from companies that manufacture a wide range of products from power generation equipment and appliances to pharmaceuticals. There's high demand for use of these unique facilities and the research opportunities that they provide. Today we'll hear from a distinguished panel of witnesses about how this program is gearing up to address the broad scope of our energy challenges. I also want to hear about the relationship between the BES program in the Office of Science and the near-term applied, applied programs uh, at DOE, like those managed by the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and the Office of Fossil Energy. We want to ensure that important discoveries at BES move on to be incorporated into new energy applications. The Basic Energy Sciences Program is a critical component in our energy research and development portfolio. I thank our witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee uh, this afternoon, and I look forward to your testimony. At this time, I'd like to recognize our distinguished ranking, uh, acting ranking member, Bigert, uh, uh, for uh, your opening statement. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this uh, hearing today on, on the basic energy sciences program in the Department of uh, Energy's Office of Science. Uh, this is certainly near and dear to my heart. Um, unfortunately, uh, Representative Inglis cannot be here today because of a scheduling conflict, uh, but he will be submitting his statement for the record. The BSE program uh, supports vitally important fundamental research which will lead to the breakthroughs necessary to develop tomorrow's technologies and achieve energy independence. It also operates world-class scientific user facilities, three of which are located at Argonne National Lab in my district. Thanks to research supported by the BES program, Argonne has been able to take a lead role in developing the next generation of energy resources, particularly in the area of nuclear power. Most recently, they have helped to develop uh, an advanced nuclear reprocessing technology uh, called UREX, which literally reburns spent fuel to extract more energy. At the same time, it improves efficiency and vastly reduces the toxicity and danger of the final waste product. This new process has the potential to end, I think, America's contentious debate over waste disposal, except maybe at the mountain. Uh, which has stymied efforts uh, to bring this important source of clean, safe, carbon-free technology into more widespread use. But nuclear power is just one example of the technologies we must develop uh, to meet our long-term energy needs. Moving forward, the BES program and the research it supports will continue to play an integral uh, role in solving our nation's energy problems. So I welcome our highly experienced and informed panel of witnesses. Look forward to their testimony and would like to thank them for sharing their knowledge with us today. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Biggert. Uh, if, there are no, uh, if there are additional opening statements, they will be placed in the record uh, at this point. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses. Uh, Dr. Patricia Damer is the Deputy Director of Science for the Department of Energy Office of Science and the former Director of the Basic Energy Sciences Program. Dr. Stephen Durker is the Associate Laboratory Director for Light Sources at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Dr. Ernest Hall is the Chief Scientist for Chemistry Technologies and Materials Characterization at GE Global Research. Dr. Russell, uh, Thomas Russell 
is a professor of polymer science and engineering at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and director of its Materials Research Science and Engineering Center on Polymers. Each of you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. And your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. And when you complete your testimony for all of you, we will then uh, begin with questions from the panel here. Each member will be given five minutes to question uh, each of you. Uh, the, uh, before we get started, before I recognize Dr. Damer, I would like to recognize a lady who is in, uh, uh, in our audience. Her name is Mary Cray. Uh, she is a member of the United Kingdom Parliament and is uh, representing a constituency of Wakefield in Yorkshire. So welcome. Glad you're, you're here joining us today and visiting the House of Representatives. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Damer, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Bigert, for the opportunity to testify in the Basic Energy Sciences Program. I served as the director of that program for 12 years from 1995 through 2007. This program has two components. The first is fundamental research structured to address DOE's missions, primarily its energy mission. The research program supports nearly 5,000 PhD scientists and more than 1,500 students in the disciplines of chemistry, material science, and aspects of biosciences and geosciences. The new knowledge gained from this research ultimately underpins development of new energy technologies. The second component of the BES program is the design, construction, and operation of a truly remarkable collection of scientific user facilities. These facilities support the research program first by enabling the production of new materials and then by enabling their characterization at the atomic level using beams of x-rays, neutrons, and electrons. In fiscal year 2007, 9,000 users visited these facilities. During the past decade, the BES program constructed $2 billion of facilities on schedule and within budget. This included the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the complete reconstruction of one of our synchrotron radiation light sources from the ground up, and five nanoscale science research centers. More than a billion dollars of additional facilities are now in design or construction. This collection of facilities supported by BES is the best in the world. It is the best in the world. And it is a critical component of maintaining U.S. supremacy in the physical sciences. The central principle of the BES program, and one that I take very seriously, is that discovery science is the foundation of innovation and future technologies. This was the inspiration for a series of one dozen workshops begun in 2001 that linked the basic research community, the applied research community, and industry in topics relevant to energy. About 1,500 researchers attended these workshops over a six-year period. We also involved representatives from DOE's National Nuclear Security Administration and all six of its technology programs. Of the ten specialty workshops, seven of them had plenary speakers from the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. The reports of those workshops describe what I call a new era of science, an era in which materials properties are designed to specifications and chemical reactions are manipulated at will. It is a science of control at the atomic level. It is the science of the 21st century. But to do this, we need knowledge that we do not have. I cannot overstate this. Even the simplest concepts still elude us. Here's just one example. Despite the efforts of hundreds, if not thousands, of researchers around the world, we still do not understand the mechanism of high temperature superconductivity, which was discovered 22 years ago. There's now dozens example of examples of high temperature superconducting materials. Now, you may ask, why is it important to understand the mechanism of this? Well, the application of superconductivity is no longer decades away. It's not even years away. Superconducting cable has been produced for some time now, and earlier this summer, nearly half a mile of power cable was installed in an existing underground right-of-way as part of the Long Island Power Authority. But without knowing the mechanism of high-temperature superconductivity, we are still using trial and error methods to develop these materials. We have no basis for the rational design of new and better materials. This is the 20th century way of doing business. It might even be the 19th century way of doing business. It is certainly not 21st century science. This example is replicated in virtually every energy technology, from solar energy conversion to electrical energy storage and batteries to solid state lighting. We need to enter this new era of science that our workshops described. I'd like to close with one additional observation from our workshops. 
During the years of our workshops, we saw rapid growth of interdisciplinary energy and environmental science activities develop at institutions around the country, both at universities and national laboratories. Our two traditional funding mechanisms, individual investigator and small group awards, both focus largely on single discipline research. In fiscal year 2009, we modified our small group funding mechanism to specifically address multidisciplinary groups of investigators working on very challenging problems in energy. We call these group awards the Energy Frontier Research Centers. Together they represent a small part, about 15% of the total research portfolio, but we think they will be an important part. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for inviting me to testify. Thank you also for your continued support of the Basic Energy Sciences Program in the Office of Science over these years. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Uh, Dr. Durker, you're re uh, recognized. And uh, also Congressman Bigert for the opportunity to provide testimony on the Basic Energy Sciences Program. I've served as the director of the National Institute on Light Source since 2001, and then more recently as the Associate Lab Director for Light Sources and Project Director for the National Institute on Light Source II project at Brookhaven National Lab. I'm pleased to share with you my perspectives on the synchrotron light sources operated by the BES program. Under BES leadership, the four BES light source facilities have thrived and flourished. They have really become one of the great success stories of the past 25 years. Created by a handful of pioneering physicists, they are now used by more than 8,000 academic, industrial, and government researchers annually from all disciplines and from every state in the United States as well as overseas. My own experience with the National Synchrotron Light Source uh, is representative of the other BES light sources. With close to 1,000 publications per year, the NSLS is one of the most prolific scientific facilities in the world. Each year attracts about 2,200 scientists from 350 universities and 90 companies to conduct research at 65 beam lines in such diverse fields as biology, physics, chemistry, geology, medicine, environmental, and material science. The BES light sources give researchers unique capabilities for carrying out basic research that's essential for the development of future energy technologies. For example, using the BES light sources, Scientists have studied catalysts that could help improve the performance of hydrogen-powered fuel cells, a key component of future clean car technologies, have studied electrolytes and lithium-ion batteries with the aim of improving their performance, have studied the properties of high-temperature superconductors, materials that conduct electricity with almost zero resistance and promise high-efficiency transmission of power for the electric grid, and have studied flame chemistry and combustion leading to more efficient designs for fuel spray nozzles. These are only a few examples of the wide-ranging, high-impact, fundamental and applied research made possible by the light sources. The goal in operating a major light source facility is to enable world-class science and technology and to operate with maximum effectiveness for all users. Large numbers of users now want to use a very limited number of beam lines, a situation distinctly different from that even 20 years ago. Many beam lines are oversubscribed and cannot meet user demand for beam time. The light sources truly represent a scarce national resource. As a result of these trends, the BES light source facilities are taking a greater role in constructing and operating the beam lines and instruments in order to better accommodate user needs and to ensure stable, reliable operations. In selecting the beam lines to be constructed at the facilities, facility management needs to ensure that the appropriate capabilities are present so that it is as productive as possible. Planning needs to prioritize among competing demands and strike the appropriate balance between different communities. All key stakeholders, including the user community, funding agencies, and facility management, actively engage in facility planning through workshops, white papers, advisory committees, and others. This inclusiveness in planning is a hallmark of the DOE selection process and is a key contributor to DOE's successful management of the light sources. Light sources routinely operate 5,500 hours per year, or about 24 hours per day for 230 days. Their accelerators at the heart of the light sources operate very reliably, generally delivering 95% of their scheduled time. However, not all of the beam lines are operating at their full potential. It's critically important that the today's facilities be provided full support for operations to meet the ever-increasing demand for synchrotron facilities. Support for research and the development of new instrumentation and detectors is equally important. The utility of today's light sources has been greatly expanded by technological progress in many areas. However, there is a critical need for even more advanced and powerful storage ring-based light sources. 
The economic and energy security of the United States requires we make major advances in developing alternative energy and pollution control technologies. Achieving this will require basic research leading to scientific breakthroughs and developing new materials with previously unimagined properties. Uh, to realize this promise, it's essential that we develop new synchrotron radiation tools that will allow the characterization of uh, materials uh, with nanoscale resolution, a uh, capability that doesn't exist today. In order to fill this, the program is uh, in, uh, carrying out the design and construction of the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, which will give this uh, capability. No other synchrotron light source will have the beam characteristics of this facility, and it will be part of a new era of science that is key to America's competitiveness. The program has outstanding track record successfully constructing uh, large and, and very productive facilities. Uh, the uh, construction plans for facilities are subjected to a rigorous series of reviews, and uh, the resulting cost schedule and technical baselines uh, establish realistic goals for the construction of those facilities. Uh, as a project director, I have the opportunity to work closely with the program management uh, as part of the integrated project team that shares a common goal of constructing this new facility on schedule and within the approved budget. It's a pleasure to work with a team, DOE team, that has such an excellent track record of understanding of the challenges encountered in the construction of new facilities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for providing this opportunity to discuss the program. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. And Dr. Hall, you're now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Acting Ranking Mem Member Biggert, Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to address the committee and provide GE's perspective on the Department of Energy's Office of Science's Basic Energy Science Program. I'm a chief scientist at GE Global Research, GE's central research and development organization. We're arguably the largest and most diversified industrial research lab in the nation, if not the world, with a proud heritage of innovation spanning more than 100 years. GE researchers have a proven record of delivering meaningful technology from breakthrough developments that include medical x-rays in the early 1900s and the first U.S. jet engine in the 1940s to advancing new energy sources today, such as solar and wind. The mission of GE Global Research is the same as it was at the time of our founding in 1900, to, to drive innovations that create new and better GE products that meet the needs of our customers and society. I have 36 years of experience in advanced methods of materials characterization and for the past 17 years have managed a group of scientists at GE Global Research who use the most advanced tools for the analysis of structure and composition of GE materials, including significant usage of the DOE synchrotron and neutron facilities. Today I'd like to share my views of, on the DOE's Office of Sciences BES program and what it means to research conducted at GE. In short, access to national synchrotron, neutron, and electron beam facilities managed by BES is critical to the development of new technologies by GE. GE primarily uses DOE synchrotron facilities at Brookhaven and Argonne National Labs and has used the NIST and Argonne neutron facilities and electron microscopy at Lawrence Berkeley and Oak Ridge National Labs. The research we perform at these national facilities is critical to GE's technology and product development and addresses some of the most important national needs. We use the synchrotron X-ray sources to buy, provide us with higher energy, higher resolution, and higher throughput experimentation than we can achieve in our own labs. For example, we can achieve a 30x reduction in the time required for some experiments using the synchrotron. These more intense X-ray sources also allow us to conduct experiments in environments that better approximate those encountered when the materials are used in applications such as gas turbines or aircraft engines. Examples of our research at the synchrotron facilities include the measurement of chemical processes occurring during the operation of advanced batteries for hybrid vehicles, the determination of the atomic mechanisms by which materials store and release hydrogen, for hydrogen-powered cars, development of nanotechnology, fuel cell development, and measuring stresses and strains in a non-destructive way to predict the life of turbine parts associated with our gas turbine business in South Carolina and our aircraft engine business in Ohio and Massachusetts. We have used the intense pulse neutron source at Argonne to study new phosphor and detector materials for higher resolution medical imaging equipment, homeland security devices, and higher efficiency lighting. 
While GE is a significant user of the synchrotron light source facilities, we could never fully utilize our own synchrotron, making access to DOE facilities essential. In addition, the regional strategy put in place by DOE is a favorable model, with GE using the Brookhaven site most frequently, given its proximity to our R&D center in upstate New York. While we have found ways to effectively utilize these facilities, there are some potential improvements that I wish to highlight on behalf of the industrial user community. We would urge these facilities to make available to in, availability to industrial users a top priority. We understand this will need to be properly balanced with outstanding fundamental research, which is currently the main priority. Industrial research has a unique set of needs and requirements, including the need for prompt access, reliable operation, and the ability to conduct repeat experiments on large numbers of samples for process development and validation, which is vital to developing robust and reliable commercial technology. We would advocate the creation of a system that would make facility time more available to industry with minimum bureaucracy and cost. If DOE wishes to impact the broadest spectrum of industrial users, then it's important to provide more than just access to the facility. Particularly for smaller companies, it will be important to provide access to facility researchers who can assist with setup of experiments, data collection, and data processing and interpretation. We are very supportive of the recent shifts that the DOE gives to funding and cons this construction and maintenance of beam lines or end stations to the facility. This increases availability and standardization. Finally, we urge that simple and cost-effective mechanisms be put in place for industry to conduct proprietary research. This is a particularly important when industry is using the facility as a characterization tool rather than conducting experiment, uh, fundamental research. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the mem other members of the committee for the opportunity to provide testimony. We have strong collaborations in place with many in agencies, especially the Department of Energy. It is our hope that we can continue to make these industry-government partnerships even stronger so that we can deliver real technologies to the marketplace that solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, Dr. Russell, you're recognized. Uh, Chairman Lamson and uh, Acting Ranking Member uh, Bigert, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify. I'm speaking to you as a scientist with 16 years of experience at the IBM Almaden Research Center, as well as uh, an academician at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in the Department of Polymer Science and Engineering. I think uh, from an, uh, an academic perspective, it's critical to be able to assess the directions or how the Department of Energy assesses the directions as to where they're going to be funding research. Uh, they've done this very effectively by study groups and workshops and have derived uh, five grand challenges that are facing the scientific community. And these grand challenges transcend uh, specific disciplines and they address problems that relate to anything from photovoltaics to solid state lighting. Uh, one is also uh, must be critical in terms of asking about technology transfer, and I'd like to give you three personal examples of research that was supported by the Department of Energy, uh, basic energy sciences, uh, in my own research, uh, and this is dealing with uh, block copolymeric materials and thin films. This, in turn, uh, has led to a recent air gap technology that IBM is currently employing, which will allow chips to operate faster and more efficiently. A second example is flash memory, where by using a similar type of technology, the longevity of uh, your uh, memory sticks actually can be increased uh, significantly. A final example uh, is in magnetic storage, whereby uh, we've developed technologies where we can get 10 terabit of information per square inch. And for uh, if you're on perspective, what this means uh, is that you'll be able to put 25 DVDs on a, on a disk the size of a quarter. Actually, it's 250 DVDs on a chip, on a, on a, on a disk the size of a quarter. That, in my opinion, is something that uh, truly uh, addresses the issue uh, of American competitiveness. Another area that the uh, DOE, uh, that where DOE uh, must involve themselves as stewards of these facilities. As an academician, I have students and postdoctoral fellows uh, who are actively conducting research, and they conduct research at these eight uh, facilities. It's, in, it's essential that these facilities be available, 
and that they be reliable. I could not have said this 15 years ago, but yet under the stewardship uh, of Pat Damer, actually, uh, what is done is that these facilities have been transformed into being very reliable and available so that when my students or postdoctoral fellows go to these facilities, they'll be able to do the experiments uh, that they were planning to do. Another issue concerns the number of facilities, and there is an issue associated with overlap and that facilities may be doing similar things. That's true, they do. But there is also an issue associated with regionality, and, and uh, Dr. Dierka has already addressed the issue of oversubscription of these facilities, and it's essential that these facilities be available to the academic community in order to execute the research. These tools, in my opinion, are indispensable, and they become even more critical as we move towards smaller and smaller structures. We hear uh, a lot about nanostructured materials, and these facilities are ideally suited to be addressing problems uh, on the nanoscale. That also is going to be essential in terms of American competitiveness. As a professor, one thing that has not been addressed is that these facilities are a tremendous educational tool for both students and postdoctoral fellows. And for the future of the United States in terms of the scientists that are being trained, having the ability to gain experience at these facilities and learn the science that these facilities enable is absolutely essential. I'd finally like to address these uh, energy frontier research centers. Energy is the number one problem that is facing the United States and all of mankind. We have the situation now where we, we must be able to develop re, uh, routes by which we can access or generate energy from any of a variety of means. This, in my opinion, is essential to involve the academic community. There's a tremendous amount of research fundamental research that needs to be done, and this can be done very effectively from the academic community. The industrial sector also can provide, uh, perform such research, but we're in a situation whereby more research right now, fundamental research is imperative, in addition to the development that can be provided by the industrial sector. I'd finally like to address one other thing. Everything sounds rosy, and it's not. And the reason it's not rosy is that the single most critical problem for me in dealing with the Department of Energy are the surety of the budgets and budget reductions. Now, this does not seem like a big issue to some extent, but let me give you one example whereby, as an academician, we need to write proposals. Proposals take several months in order to write. Last year, we were in a situation where I would say there were approximately 300 proposals that were written and submitted to the Department of Energy addressing energy issues, issues that are the most critical problem facing us right now. At the end of all of this, after all the proposals were written, ranked, etc., the, the, uh, the funding was cut from this. For me as an academician, this is truly frustrating takes a huge amount of effort and energy in order to write these proposals, in order to fund the research and students uh, and postdoctoral fellows that work, with the, that work with me. So for me, budget reductions uh, are probably one of the single most critical problems that we are facing right now uh, from the academic sector. So with that, uh, Chairman, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you uh, an academic uh, perspective with a little bit of industrial perspective thrown in. Thank you very much, Dr. Russell. Uh, I happen to believe very much like what your last comment was about. We have uh, truly taken away the opportunity too often from what uh, to, to grow the knowledge that we need to solve the problems that we face, um, and it's seen uh, an, an awful lot of times. Well, hopefully we'll be able to <coughs> to change uh, some of that, and hopefully it'll be quick enough to make the difference that all of us would like to see made, particularly those of us on this committee. Um, let me start with Dr. Damer, uh, and I'll recognize my, I better say that, I'm supposed to recognize myself for five minutes, uh, uh, at, uh, after which time I'll pass uh, uh, to the next uh, member of Congress. Uh, but Dr. Damer, in your testimony, you note a number of ways that energy research and development is coordinated across the Department of Energy. However, we still hear significant issues of stove piping uh, at the department. Do you agree? And how can this coordination be improved, particularly between the Office of uh, uh, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and the Office of Science? Well, uh, I have also heard a lot of uh, talk about stove piping. 
Uh, I think a couple of things have happened in the recent few years that are working to change that. The first is this entire series of workshops uh, that have really energized the scientific community. In all of my years in science, and it's quite a lot of years now, um, I've never seen the scientific community so energized as I have over the problems of energy. And this is real. And Tom Russell said that 300 proposals were turned down. It was actually 700, Tom. Um, <laughs> your chances were less. Uh, but something else has happened in the department, and that's the creation of the Undersecretary for Science position. And uh, when Ray Orbach was confirmed as Undersecretary of Science, the first thing that he did was to do uh, an, uh, a DOE-wide assessment of basic and applied research. He had all of the technology offices come in and speak to him about what they were doing. And he asked specifically the Office of Science how could they help uh, the various problems. As a result of those assessments, which took, which took several months, uh, Dr. Orbach came up with about two dozen areas that were ripe for R&D integration. Uh, many of these actually appeared in the budget and will continue to appear in the budget in future years. Uh, these are areas that not, not coincidentally uh, were topics of the Basic Research Needs Workshop Series and areas where the technology offices and the Office of Science are coming together much more closely to devise roadmaps, planning scenarios, to integrate their performers in the field, to hold joint workshops, to hold joint contractor meetings, uh, to advise one another on how uh, calls for proposals ought to be written, and to help one another uh, review the proposals. Uh, I have seen a change. I've been in the Department of Energy for 13 years, and I've seen a dramatic change in the last three, and I would like to see that continue. An interagency biomass research and development board was recently uh, created that includes representatives from both the Office of Science and EERE uh, within uh, DOE, as well as those from NSF, USDA, EPA, and several other relevant agencies. Do you think it's a good model to coordinate uh, uh, other energy research that's fostered by, a, by multiple programs and agencies like solar energy and advanced battery research? Uh, yes, I've, I've served on a, on a large number of interagency working groups, and I'm familiar with the Biomass Board. And in general, they are successful. I, uh, I have particular experience with interagency working groups for the, for the large-scale facilities, the synchrotron light sources and the neutron scattering facilities, and they've been very successful. The, energy, the Senate Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee has, has proposed uh, cutting solar research out of basic energy, out of the basic energy sciences program, and shifting $60 million to the solar program in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Does this make sense to you? And if not, then why should the Office of Science be the steward of the kind of solar research it currently oversees? Well, the Basic Energy Sciences Program has had the largest solar photochemistry program in the nation for decades. Uh, and I am personally very proud of that. As a result of the workshops, that solar photochemistry program has become integrated with the photosynthesis program so that uh, uh, plant photosynthesis and inorganic solar photochemistry are now completely integrated. It's a wonderful program. Uh, of, the three, of the 250 letters of intent that the Basic Energy Sciences Program received for the Energy Frontier Research Centers, by far the largest number were in solar energy. Basic Energy Sciences is known for its fundamental research in solar energy. We, we support the activities in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, and we note with great pride that some of the things that they are working on now were actually discovered in the Basic Energy Sciences Program and not very long ago. In my opinion, both the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and Basic Energy Sciences ought to be robustly funded for photochemistry and solar energy conversion. Dr. Russell, will you, will you comment on that as well, please? I think by removing uh, the uh, or shifting the funds from BES to EERE, one of the things that will inevitably happen is that the amount of funds that will be going into the academic community is going to be much less. 
I think if you look at some of the advances that have been made, uh, and if I look at photovoltaics, the most, uh, the most efficient photovoltaic device uh, is about 50 percent uh, efficient. That was actually discovered in the academic uh, community. If I look at some of the results that have been coming out in terms of the all-organic type photovoltaic devices, advances have been made on the, in the academic sector. I fear that if monies are shifted from BES to EERE, then that is going to remove those funds uh, from the uh, academic sector where I think a lot of basic research uh, can be done. Development work is clear, needs to be done as well in, this, in that having the industrial sector involved as well is important. However, by re removing this to EERE, the amount of funds that will be put into the academic sector is going to be much less. I think that's a mistake. Thank you very much. Ms. Bigger, you're recognized for five minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to continue with Dr. Damer and probably Dr. Russell. Hopefully we'll have another round if we don't get it. Uh, uh, Dr. Damer, uh, I think we're aware that uh, the major facilities have uh, struggled with ad adequate op operating uh, budgets, and we certainly uh, had to add something into the, the uh, supplemental budget uh, for the the labs to continue in 2008, but now we're worried about the 2009 budget and whether that will really go back to the 2007 budget. So we certainly aren't out of the woods as far as uh, dealing with that budget. But uh, are you are you concerned? And and I think this ties in a little bit to the budget about the expertise in the energy science to going to foreign countries. Uh, uh, or our ability to attract scientists uh, from abroad as we once uh, did. And do you see that as a, um, a connection to the economic competitiveness? Uh, yes. So let, let me talk for a second about the scientific user facilities. Those facilities should be funded probably 10 to 15 percent above where they are funded right now. And in 2007, 2008, and 2009, the BES budget request includes that funding. Uh, when the funding was not appropriated, those facilities survived largely by ca cannibalizing funds that they would use for routine maintenance, upgrades, spares, and so forth. Uh, although the facilities, for the most part, continue to run at the 5,500 hours a year that Steve Durker mentioned, they are really straining to do so. And uh, a very bad outcome could happen if they don't get increased funding. So that's the scientific user facilities. In terms of attracting scientists to energy, uh, U.S. scientists and foreign scientists, um, the scientific community is like herding cats. You, you, uh, uh, you can't herd them, but you can move the food. And, uh, the, <laughs> and the large amount of money the large amount of money uh, that was included in the BES budget in 2007, 8, and 9 for basic research in energy was certainly an attractor to the scientific community. And I mentioned a moment ago that we had to turn down 700 peer-reviewed proposals uh, when the funding didn't come through. But like cats, the scientific community learns, and three times they learn pretty well that they won't go after that food again. So, so the answer to your question, although somewhat jocularly, is yes, I am concerned about retaining not only U.S. scientists but foreign scientists <coughs> in uh, fundamental research related to energy. If we cannot do this, as a country, we will have been diminished. And, I, and I ha, as I said a moment ago, I have never seen the level of enthusiasm in the scientific community as I had as a result of these workshops. I don't want to lose that enthusiasm. I don't want to lose these scientists. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, Dr. Russell, how, how would you uh, compare our national use facilities to those uh, in other countries? I think what uh, uh, Pat Damer said is correct, that the facilities that the Ameri American scientists have available to them are absolutely world class. Uh, these facilities are as good as any facilities that you get anywhere in the world, and that would include Europe as well as Asia. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Hall, and, uh, if you can't get access to the user facilities uh, when you need it, uh, what are the re repercussions to your research, and are there other viable options for uh, GE and other industrial users? Uh, uh, do have reasonably good access to uh, these uh, user facilities. Uh, the question often comes as to 
So there are many different types of access that we need, and, and very much as you think about these facilities, uh, you know, they play two really important roles. One is as tools for fundamental research, and the second is as probably the best characterization tools in the world. And what we generally are seeking are access in the latter category where we need to characterize materials. And so we're looking at trying to get uh, better access on a number of time frames, in some cases longer range research where we can use the proposal system, but also in a sort of a rapid access mode where we can investigate issues with that occur during technology development. If we can't get access to these facilities, since these are such superb facilities for, for materials characterization, it will definitely slow our programs. Uh, we will try to find alternatives. We can sometimes use in-house resources. Really access to these superb facilities is, is critical and can be very problematical if, if that the, the resources aren't there for both the facilities and the researchers at these. At thank you. Thank you. I um, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Appreciate very much your testimony today. I have here a uh, an energy news roundup, and it notes that there were three editorials in the Hill today uh, relative to uh, energy. It notes that the Senate is working on an energy bill that uh, nobody seems enthusiastic about. They have to get 60 votes there to pass something. The uh, House is struggling to find an approach to an energy bill that can get the requisite 218 uh, votes. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, an interview with uh, Charles Maxwell, who very correctly predicted the uh, high price of uh, oil now and just recently even higher who says that by, I think, 2015, oil will be $300 a barrel. Uh, very interested in your testimony and the potential that could come from this uh, basic research that, the, uh, uh, that is being done. And I noticed that most of that potential would result in the production of uh, electricity. But the real crunch in the uh, near term and uh, midterm and far term actually uh, is not going to be for electricity because with a lot of solar and wind and much more nuclear and true geothermal where you tap into the molten core of the earth and with micro hydro that might produce as much as macro hydro without the environmental degradation we could probably produce as enough as much electricity as we ought to be used and maybe not as much as we'd like to be using but there is no such rosy outlook for uh, liquid fuels there's just no silver bullet out there. Uh, two bubbles have already broken. The corn ethanol bubble, which was destined to break because simple back of the envelope computations said that that was never going anywhere and it didn't. Uh, the, uh, uh, the hydrogen bubble broke a bit before the corn ethanol bubble. And finally, people figured out hydrogen is not an energy source. It is simply a battery, if you will, that carries energy from one place to another. Now our hopes are on a third bubble, which will shortly break, because there's a rational exuberance uh, about um, uh, cellulosic ethanol. You will never get more energy from cellulose than if you simply burned it. And it's inconceivable to me that we're going to get much more energy from our wasteland, not good enough to grow anything on, than we could get from all of our corn and all of our soybeans, where you know the National Academy has said that we might displace 2.4% of our gasoline if we use all of our corn for ethanol, and 2.9% of our diesel if we use all of our soybeans for soy diesel. What kind of prospects, and I'm a scientist, I'm one of three in Congress, and I know you do basic science, not because there will be any societal benefit, because you want to advance knowledge, and there will be societal benefit if you advance knowledge. But what are we looking at that could possibly provide the quantity and quality of energy that we're getting from the 84 or 5 million barrels of oil that we produce uh, today, 21 or 22 of which are used by the United States, and each barrel has the energy equivalent of 12 people working all year. What is there in the future that could come even close 
to the quality in terms of, of density and, uh, and uh, uh, quantity, quality and quantity that we get from, from oil. Are you asking me, sir? Uh, any of you. Okay. Uh, so you're absolutely right in everything you say. I, I agree with you completely. In the short term, uh, for um, uh, transportation, we only have um, uh, fuel switching as an option. And uh, the fuel switching, uh, uh, cor uh, corn ethanol is not the answer. Uh, in the short term, cellulosic ethanol may be a partial answer. Um, there is also fuel switching to different kinds of uh, petroleum-based products, uh, uh, oil shale, tar sands, and so forth. Again, a short-term solution, but a solution uh, nevertheless. Uh, what we really need is a long-term, sort of decades to century energy strategy here for transportation. It may well be that it involves a combination of um, ethanol produced not cellulosically, but uh, perhaps biomimetically, uh, combined with, um, with electric. So there may be some hybrids, but, but right now we have to do a transition from where we are today to a 10, 20, 30-year solution and ultimately to a 50, 100-year solution. But I agree with all of the assessments that you just stated. Mr. Chairman, the real tragedy is that we knew of an absolute certainty 28 years ago that we were going to be here today. Because 28 years ago, we could look back to 10 years prior to that, 1970, where M. King Hubbard's prediction about oil production in the United States came true. We reached our maximum production. Today, in spite of drilling more oil wells than all of the rest of the world put together and finding oil in Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico, which he had not included, today we produce half the oil that we did in 1970. It's really quite a shame that we're here today. Thank you very much. We were also told in 1945 by the United States Army to diversify away from our dependence on fossil fuels, and we ignored that as well. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> we're, we're into ignoring things. Our government has paid for four studies in the last several years, two of them in 05. Uh, one of them, the Hirsch Report, the second one, a report by the Corps of Engineers, two of them last year, one by the Government Accountability Office, another by the National Petroleum Council. All four of them said the same thing. The peaking of oil is a certainty. It is either present or imminent with potentially devastating consequences. And nobody in leadership in our country has done, has recognized any of these reports and the challenge that it provides. So, so we're into ignoring things. Well, unfortunately, you're right. And uh, it's going to take the scientific community to fix it for us. Uh, so we need to be about, uh, you want to make a comment, Dr. Russell? Help yourself. Uh, we're in a situation now where it is inevitable and we can't ignore well, I'm, I believe, sir, that we're in a situation where, uh, as predicted by the Hearst report, that said that unless you anticipated the peaking of oil by a decade, uh, to have no economic consequence, you have to anticipate it by two decades. To have meaningful but maybe manageable economic consequences, you need to predict it by, need to precede it by a decade. It's here, I believe, and we've done nothing. I, I agree with you completely, and now the only point I am making is that we can't ignore this anymore because it is inevitable. And I think that uh, well, uh, we shouldn't, but I'm afraid that politicians can. <laughs> we better find a way. Let's start with Dr. Hall again. Uh, you, you, uh, Dr. Hall, I haven't asked before. Uh, you note that in your team's experience, quote, gaining access to sufficient beam time on a timely basis can be challenging, unquote. Does GE have experience with the rapid access system that Dr. Durker describes in his testimony, and how would how would it be uh, how would it be improved? I think we do have we do have uh, experience with that, and I do want to, to make it clear that the uh, researchers uh, at uh, the Department of Energy labs certainly are as accommodating as as they can be in many cases to meeting our needs. Uh, I think that that uh, uh, my testimony really focused on sort of a philosophical shift uh, as we think about these facilities. And this is, this is again, something that, that uh, really needs to be considered at a policy level uh, as to how these facilities would be uh, best utilized. And we know, as, as we heard about the history of these facilities and read about the history of these facilities, that they came from, from a philosophy of doing basic sinus, science. Um, 
I'm here to say that they're also incredibly important tools for, for characterization and for moving technology forward uh, as, as industry tries to solve the most important challenges. And so as we think about that, uh, we, need to, we need to think about uh, what the priorities should be, how, how the Department of Energy should set priorities uh, rel relative to basic research versus uh, use of these facilities as, as characterization tools, and whether, for example, uh, certain amounts of time uh, should be set aside uh, for industrial use, uh, additional time set aside for rapid access use. Uh, and again, this is, this is a sort of a policy question uh, that uh, we are certainly very happy to, I'm sure many of the industrial users are very happy to partner with, with DOE. I'm not here to propose you know, specific solutions, but only to uh, raise the question of, of how we want to best utilize uh, incredibly important facilities, and of course, much of the availability of both beam time and researchers goes back to the back to the budget question and the the need to properly fund these these facilities. Dr. Durker, would you comment? The uh, provision for rapid access is one that uh, is becoming more common at the facilities as the need that Dr. Hall described has become more apparent. Often the kind of industrial characterization measurements that he's referring to, I believe, are ones that can be done very quickly. Uh, even in, as short as uh, 10 minutes of access to beam time can give a uh, very important answer for industry. The uh, challenge is getting access quickly and having the facility have the staff and the instrumentation to have a very high throughput of these kind of uh, characterization measurements to uh, serve the needs of industry. And so I think that the facilities have established uh, user access that uh, uh, is going in this direction even more and more, uh, and with proper support for staffing and operating the kinds of high throughput characterization facilities that uh, are especially important to industry, I, I think that uh, we can meet that need. Thank you. In addition to scientific merit, do you think it would uh, make sense to uh, take American competitiveness into account when reviewing proposals for time on the facilities? And should this be a separate competition, or would a separate user fee structure be justified for industrial research that doesn't need uh, intellectual property protection? And I'd like for Dr. Durker and uh, Dr. Hall to respond. I think that uh, the criteria that are used in evaluating proposals need to give proper recognition to the impact of uh, research on industry and so that both scientific impact and technological innovation that comes from the results of the measurements have to be equally recognized. Uh, I do believe that the peer review process uh, and open competition uh, is proven to guarantee the best uh, work is done, whether its goals are pure science or technological innovation. And so I believe that uh, that kind of a process with proper guidance to the evaluation criteria uh, is the best path for having the best work done. And uh, I think that a ticket system uh, would uh, compromise that uh, competitive uh, peer review process. Dr. Damer, I think we all, rec uh, all appreciate your efforts to identify and prioritize your research in areas that can have the most impact on our uh, future energy options. I do have a few questions on your proposal to create uh, 25 to 35 uh, energy frontier research centers. Uh, you note in your testimony that they, uh, quote, should be viewed as a funding mechanism, unquote, and that, quote, no building construction will be part of the awards, unquote. Given this, does it even makes sense to call them centers, which implies some kind of permanence. Uh, maybe they should be called Energy Frontier Research Awards or collaborations. Your thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, I, I didn't fully appreciate the, um, the ramifications of the word center 
uh, we had no intent to uh, associate construction with these, and we also did not have any intention uh, to continue them in perpetuity. Uh, they would be stood up for five years, and uh, they would undergo regular peer review competition. Uh, and I would envision, although I'm no longer a director of the Basic Energy Sciences Program, I had envisioned something like uh, calls for proposals every, say, two to three years, and uh, those centers or those collaborations uh, that were completing their five-year uh, term would be competed with new ones. And so I would, I would envision uh, rotation in and out with the best ideas and the best collaborations being successful. Thank you. Dr. Russell, do you view this as a good proposal to get the best minds in the academic community more involved in tackling these issues? Uh, yes, but I, I'd like to address the issue of centers that I, I run a materials research science and engineering, engineering center. That does not require a building, and nor is there any permanence to this. And there's other precedent in that there, uh, the National Science Foundation has science and technology centers and engineering research centers, and none of these require you to have a, a building or any sort of structure that's going to have any uh, permanence to this. Uh, do I think, uh, in terms of these uh, EFRCs that you're that you're mentioning about the 25 to 40 of these, I, I think it's imperative that this uh, be uh, made available to the academic community, and this is a means by which one can get some of the best minds in the country working on these problems and being funded to work on these uh, problems in, in a manner that they can actually conduct the research uh, in a viable way. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bigger, do you recognize for five minutes? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Hall, you, uh, in your written testimony, you talked about the, that there were uh, concerns of of um, pri uh, proprietary research. Could you, could you uh, uh, expound on that? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, and, and, you know, I can speak for some segment of, of the industrial user base. Uh, you should recognize that in the chemical and pharmaceutical industries, which also heavily use these facilities, uh, in some cases proprietary issues are even uh, are even more significant, and uh, I encourage you to you know, explore their, their needs as well. Um, I would like to just encourage us to have uh, a mechanism, since we need to, on occasion, bring materials uh, to the, the facilities where we are trying to answer some questions about the structure and chemistry of these materials, materials that have been developed in our own labs, and we need, in order to do that, if these are proprietary materials, we need proper protection to uh, ensure that, that uh, we own uh, the results of those, of those investigations. Again, they may be the types of investigations that Dr. Dierker was talking about where we may only need a, a very short amount of time on these, on these uh, facilities in order to get the answers that we need. So my encouragement here is that we have systems in place where we can very simply execute proprietary agreements that are clear and straightforward and that can enable us to do this. Again, I, I think this is key to moving what, American technology forward. What, what, what do you mean by the total cost re recovery option? There is a system in place and, and certainly probably can speak to this even more uh, extensively than, than, uh, than I can. Uh, the, there is a, a, a system in place where when an industry brings uh, proprietary research to the facility uh, that a fee is charged and that is based on a, a total cost recovery. This is separate from the proposal process which generally involves a non-proprietary work. I will tell you that in GE's case, most of the work that we actually do with the synchrotron is non-proprietary and collaborative in partnership uh, with the scientists at, at the facility. Uh, but speaking for industry as a whole, proprietary concerns when using these facilities are certainly uh, large and important. Do you, uh, do you have pat is this uh, materials that are patented? Is that uh, a problem? Patented or, or patentable, yes. Protection, yes, that's right. Certainly, once a material is, is fully patented, then we, we have the protection we need. These would be materials under development. Uh, Dr. Dreiker, would you like to uh, uh, add anything to that? Yes. Uh, we do have uh, 
procedures for uh, proprietary work to be carried out, which does not require the industry to reveal any proprietary information. And the uh, total cost recovery you're referring to is a quite nominal fee, I believe, uh, since the facility operates for so many hours per year and there's there may be dozens of beam lines operating at the same time, uh, the operating costs are divided by the number of beam line hours. And so in the case of the National Synchrotron Light Source, for example, I think it's about $110 per hour <coughs> is the proprietary fee. So it's, uh, I don't think it's any impediment to the industrial research. And, and there are safeguards in, in place that uh, permit the work to be, uh, be done and pr patents protected. Thank you. Then, then uh, uh, Dr. Damer, what, um, what's the right balance between the uh, important new facilities such as N NSLS2 and the continued operation of very successful uh, existing facilities such as the Advanced Photon Source? That, <clears throat> that's a difficult question that comes up all of the time. You constantly have to work to be at the forefront of science and technology. And that means making some difficult choices, perhaps, with facilities that are past their time. Uh, we have a number of facilities in the Basic Energy Sciences Program that are very new and very modern, and all of those need to be supported. And at some point, the new director of Basic Energy Sciences may have to make some hard choices about the older facilities. Uh, but we, uh, the ones that you mentioned, the advanced photon source, the spallation neutron source, the facility under construction that Steve Durker is chair of, these are cutting edge facilities that will keep the United States at the forefront of the physical sciences and technology. So, so many times, or we, we get the uh, from the Department of Energy and what the the top projects are, you know, the top 20, and we start talking about those, and then all of a sudden it changes. <laughs> and uh, uh, do, you, do you see that, um, that, that these will remain at the top priority? Yes. Actually, the, the uh, Facilities of the Future um, a brochure that was put out probably five years ago now uh, rank ordered a number of facilities. The ones in the top tier actually all have gone forward. Uh, there were a couple of changes. But over a five-year period, you would expect that you would have those few changes. Um, uh, some facilities uh, fell off the map, and a couple of other facilities rose in priority. But I can say that the ones in the top tier all have gone forward and have been very successful. Okay. Then uh, just go back for a minute to the, to the budget and our... What we have tried and tried to uh, double the funding for the Office of Science and so many uh, opportunities, and it always seems that um, somehow it, it, it gets cut out. And uh, how can we as Congress, uh, and what we've tried to do is to inform our other, the other members of the importance of this, but what, from your point of view, what can we do really to impress upon the Congress that it really is uh, our charge, you know, in to ensure that we are going to be competitive through the use of uh, basic science research? Well, I think perhaps um, if there has been a failure, it's a multi-point failure, and it's partly a failure of the scientific community and the agencies as well, that we have not made the case clearly enough that there is a link between fundamental research, discovery, innovation, and competitiveness. And I think that that link has to be made much more strongly. Uh, we've heard examples here today of it. Uh, but this is real, and I, what I have seen from Congress is that there is a strong sense that doubling the physical sciences, doubling the budgets of these three agencies, including the Office of Science, is critical. Um, and if other members are not convinced, I think it's, um, it's the responsibility of all of us to make the case more strongly. Anyone else like to add to that? Mr. Hall? I would only say that that uh, one important point, once again, is is that to solve the most pressing problems that we are facing as a nation it is going to be critically important that we have strong industry, government, university partnerships around these technology areas. The availability of these types of, of facilities is a key part of that partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yield back. Thank you. Dr. Bartlett, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Dr. Deemer, when you mentioned uh, failure, you were referring to what as failure? 
I personally strongly believe in the link between fundamental research, discovery, innovation, technology development. And I, you know, I spent the last six or eight years of my life leading these workshops uh, to demonstrate that and to energize the basic research community uh, so that they would be part of the common cause. Uh, if the message uh, hasn't gotten through to those who make the decisions, then I think that that still remains a failure on our part. Okay, okay. When I first came to the Congress about 16 years ago, there was a proposal that we should fund only basic research that would have societal benefits. And I asked them how were they going to do that? Because I'm sure that Madame Curie had no idea what societal benefits would accrue to her early discoveries in radiation. They asked me then, what? I said, well, you just provide an adequate amount of money, which we do not, to support an adequate number of basic researchers, which we do not. And I will assure you that if you just leave them free to pursue their interest in discovering new information, that there will be societal uh, benefits. I gather that... Uh, uh, Mr. Hall, you're primarily interested in developmental things that will ultimately have societal benefits. I'm here speaking on behalf of, of General Electric, and in, in my role, technology development is, yeah. is very critical. But I, I clearly said in, in my testimony that this needs to be, the, particularly for these facilities, uh, the uh, characterization or technology development piece clearly needs to be balanced. Uh, with with the need for outstanding fundamental research. Yeah, the rest of you are primarily interested in fundamental research, I gather from your testimony and your positions. I would hope that you would stoutly resist any attempt to try to direct you into basic research, fundamental research pursuits that are likely to have societal benefits. And I trust that you will do that. Yes, sir. Can I trust that you could speak to the funding agencies? And the reason why I say that is every academician, when they are writing a proposal to get funding for basic research, there must be a section of that proposal that discusses or treats what sort of societal impact that may potentially evolve from that research. Uh, that's too bad. Well, that is reality. It's too bad, and uh, Mr. Chairman, we should uh, strive to remove that requirement because no one knows when there will be societal benefits that comes to basic research. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and it would be wonderful if that could be removed. Uh, there are several of us in Congress, three scientists and several others that uh, agree with us, and uh, we, will, uh, we will try. Uh, this uh, hearing is focused on uh, energy, and um, one of the things that uh, I have supported, and it's now the law, although not being implemented by the administration who didn't like that law, and that is the creation of, uh, of uh, ARPA-E. I gather you're all familiar with DARPA. Uh, their customer, of course, is the Department of Defense, and they have been enormously successful because what they do is to fund far out things that uh, the board of directors uh, couldn't justify funding with their stockholders' money because the, uh, uh, the payoff is far too distant and the probability of a payoff is small. Uh, do you think that uh, in the energy, RP, of course, would be a DARPA-like thing for, for energy. Do you think that there is a, a reasonable role for that as we tackle a problem we should have been tackling at least 28 years ago? Well, as you correctly pointed out, um, ARPA-E uh, was in the Authorization Act uh, but has not been funded. Um, and so I'm not going to comment on, on the administration's position because I think you know that. But perhaps I can, I can speak to one other thing that talks about way out fundamental long-term high-risk research. After 11 basic research needs workshops in different areas of energy, I was hearing the same kinds of things over and over again. 
that we need to um, uh, control the movement movement of electrons and materials, that we need to be able to assemble from the atomic level up. Uh, however, I got the sense from the community that they were too skewed toward the end product, which was an energy technology. And so I was the one who impaneled a final workshop to look at grand challenges in science that had nothing to do with energy technologies and that were stripped of disciplinary labels. And that's the workshop that Tom Russell talked about in his opening remarks. I want to keep the basic energy sciences research community as focused on long-term scientific challenges that may not have an immediate payoff as they are on the energy needs of the department. And I can tell you it's a very difficult challenge because, as Tom said, researchers are programmed to put in the opening paragraph of their proposals the societal relevance and, in the case of the Department of Energy, the energy relevance. But from someone who stewarded a basic research program for, ten, for 12 years, I know that you have to keep this community focused on long-term discovery science, and I've worked very hard to do it, but it's a struggle. That required, of course, um, uh, indicates the naivety and the ignorance of uh, the general public and uh, Congress, and we have truly representative government uh, about uh, uh, basic research and what it is and uh, how it should be conducted. Thank you all very much for your testimony and your service. Thank you, Dr. Bartlett. I want to thank all of you. This has been fascinating. And I have uh, probably another dozen questions that I'd like to ask. We will uh, take a different tact at this point, though. Uh, I'll express my appreciation for your appearing before the committee this afternoon uh, and say that under the rules of the committee, the record will be held open for uh, two weeks for members to submit additional statements and any additional questions, such as mine, uh, that might have that uh, they might have for the witnesses. Uh, we appreciate your coming. Have a good day. And this meeting, uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.